I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Around the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Hello everybody, this is your host Nino, quoting your amazing poet Shelley. And I welcome you to an episode concerning a rather strange way of setting up the Asus EEE PC701. A device from 2007 with a look from the 1970s. And as opposed to my usual attempts of showing you something, if unusual, then still practicable, this one does not try that at all. We are going to dive straight into madness and explore Android 404x86 on that machine. Do not be surprised, I was not actually able to find screen recording software for Android 4. That is, I found a couple of programs, but they did not work very impressively. And so, you get to see everything that way. And on the other hand, that gives you a clear impression of what it is like to boot the once mightiest and most famous version of Android. For Android 4, it was that unified the lines for the tablet, known as Android 3, for which you'll find nowadays nearly nothing, and the more famous and much more common Android 2 lines, with like systems like 2.1, 2.3, 2.5 being such which were in very common use. However, all of those systems were mostly used on ARM processors, in particular, the ARM v7 architecture seems to be the one targeted by most vendors. So, that puts us now in a rather strange position as we are trying to use Android 404 on an x86 processor. Indeed, an image suitable for installation on the ASUS EEE PC appeared soon enough. And from the experience of installing it, I can tell you it went smoothly and without great difficulty. And you can easily find it if you're Googling for Android x86 for the EEE PC 701. This is a specially adjusted to version on which both the somewhat unusual display of 800 times 480 pixels will work as well as the innate wireless adapter. It does seem though that Bluetooth does not work, but that is the least of my worries. So, what does the most mighty Android have to offer us from times long past? The first thing it offers is difficulties. This is an x86 architecture, as already mentioned. And even though Android apps purportedly are aiming to be executable anywhere in much the same way, what they truly mean is anywhere on ARM's processors. For a lot of very popular apps that have been very common at the time of Android 4 and even previously, were in fact compiled particularly for ARM. 
You will, if you look into the matter, certainly find guides which are proposing you to install something called Lib Houdini, like a Houdini library, apparently a form of layer which allowed the execution of ARM programs on x86 processors. Trouble is, those links are long since dead. So, here you are facing a nice system which is not allowing the execution of ARM programs. Which brings us to our first question. Where do we get software from? And this, to be sincere, happens with the help of the gutter of the internet. That is all sorts of websites like APK Mirror, APK Pure and whatnot, which are hosting old versions of APKs, preferably where you can find out whether a version is either presented as no arc, that is not compiled to any specific architecture in particular, or as x86. And these denominations are often unreliable to top it off. That is, in many cases you may download an app, it may even install but then it will either not open or crash or something else terrible will happen. But anyway, it will not work as advertised. So first step in running Android 404 is procuring the programs. And to tell you frankly, I could not procure all that many, but I shall give you a brief guide of what I managed nonetheless to find. And to tell it immediately, your biggest issue is to find a decent browser. To tell you the truth, I did not find any normal usual solution for that. I am in many ways still stuck with the stock browser and <laughs> on that a lot of websites simply do not work. Incidentally, let us try to visit the website of Alpine Linux. More about that somewhat later on. So. Alpine Linux, which is perfectly visible on a normal browser in modern times, is indeed found by Google easily enough. Here it is. And if I go here, never seen that guy in my life, right? And a lot of stuff is that way. So if you decide to put indeed this old operating system on your netbook, be aware that you will run into such trouble. At the same time, you will not be really able to put any much more recent version of it on it. For that, the problems are twofold. On the one hand, newer versions of Android often lacked the specific adjustments which were needed for the EPC. That is, it is full of reports where somebody managed to boot something but then the screen wouldn't work. The other trouble you're having is, this is a machine with 4 GB disk, not 4 GB RAM. The RAM itself is only half a GB. So more modern versions of Android at some point simply become out of question, even if they actually, in a much nicer way, include ARM translation already. So if you decide to go for the adventure, together with me here, so that we explore this old system for authenticity purposes, then be aware this is quite a rocky road. But not all is lost. There was quite a few, there are quite a few programs which I did manage to find, which you might find useful and which I shall in the following outline to you. Indeed, I have bought a lot of these at the time and I'm somewhat amused to fish them out of the dirt in order to use them again. So you do actually have a good selection of terminal emulators. There's the default one, there's also Termius, Juice SHA and ConnectBot. With all of these three, you can actually establish both local and remote connections. I even managed to find a USB serial terminal. One of the most annoying things you will easily stumble across is that many programs insist on being in portrait mode. Like for instance, this one, acrylic paint. I start it, 
and my screen turns. Because you know, for some reason, these programs decide that the screen should not be wider than high. The thing you can do, should that happen to you, is carefully and counterintuitively navigate the pad, get out of there, and then activate an app called Control Screen, one with two overcrossed phones, basically. And there you can determine that the screen shall only be horizontal. So select screen orientation. There you say landscape, very good. Now we can go back and then you start the service. I could also automatically start it on boot. But that is certainly an interesting annoyance that happens not only in the paint program, but also in a lot of other things where suddenly the screen turns and you're apparently expected to use your netbook like an accordion. But once you do that, everything becomes suddenly a lot more civil and there is indeed a paint program. And I must, might say acrylic paint here is the only one out of quite a lot of paint programs that I tried which was working on x86. Indeed many old programs which many of us may have collected and saved as APK for some future use are useful not on the x86 architecture. So prepare for a bit of a hunt. All right, enough of that. What else have we got here? So we got terminals. We also got a USB serial terminal in case I would like to attach or correspond with serial devices. As far as office suits go, there are three which I tried and which all seem to work. Documents to go, Quick Office and Kingsoft Office. From the museum, in style interest. Most remarkable is Quick Office, as that got pulled from the market by Google after it acquired the company and integrated it into its mobile offering, that is these um, Google Docs. So one can say this is actually an interesting piece of software which you won't find in your modern devices. Hello from the past. Whoops. Yeah, finally. <laughs> so that works. And here on the right side, you have a little bit of a menu to, to do things. And if I press control A, it does not actually select it. I'll have to double click and then shift around these under it markers. And then I can, I don't know, select the font and, and do things with it. So you see, this is actually a user interface, less geared towards a netbook and more geared towards a phone. Okay, now we will forget about that one. Let's go to the next one. The other one of similar style and which is, if I am not entirely wrong, still available is Documents to Go, which is a very nice office suit, again, more geared towards a phone user interface. So I'm opening again a document and hello to all. And if I now press control A, I do select all. Yeah, so here the shortcut works a bit more normally, but again, you click up on the right upper corner in order to format that in, in any way, right? So it works satisfactorily if you need urgently to edit some Word document on your EPC. So that certainly is a reasonable acquisition. Okay, and now the final office suit I want to show you. Yeah, has stopped. Okay, here it crashed on me. The final one is Kingsoft Office. This is perhaps the most desktop-like of the three, as it is a Chinese clone, essentially, of OpenOffice slash LibreOffice. And it behaves the most like a desktop application, even having, as you can see here, ribbons 
with uh, formatting commands and general editing commands. Like for instance, I can edit the font up here and it works very nicely. I admit it is my favorite of these three. All right, so if you can change the font and it will be, let's make it <laughs> Times New Roman doesn't exist. Let's take Droid Serif then, very good. So that is perhaps the one I would most recommend you from the working perspective of a netbook, though I admit that I also like very much documents to go. All right. <laughs> Now, we have seen the office suits. What else have we got here in general? Perhaps I shall pick out a few more noteworthy um, additions. There is the Algeo Scientific Calculator. I am and always have been pretty fond of it. Like here you see I have checked it for the cosinus of 5. So that's how it works and when you swipe left you, you happen to get even more functions here. Right, all the trigonometric ones and so forth. So, yeah, that's nice to have and gives the netbook more present value, if you will. Then there is the T-Edit text editor. In a version which is still open source, it is of rather recent time, and I am in general quite fond of it, but even more do I like actually the integrated text editor of the Ghost Commander. So... Uh, just no misclicked. So here's high C and I want to edit it. Right, so that is what its integrated editor looks like. Here I'm having a C Hello World program. And you can actually even avoid installing an extra text editor if you have Ghost Commander. It has this familiar Norton Commander-like interface. Other than that, couple of drawing programs. Really funny is Pixelesque because there you're not supposed even to draw anything very fine. Everything is starkly pixelated. And as a perhaps last really noteworthy thing, <laughs> the Google Maps, as opposed to the browsing experience, seem to be working very properly. Like if I open it here, I am looking at the city center of Sofia, Bulgaria. And I can zoom in and zoom out and everything is shown just nicely. So yeah, the maps are usable. Again, this makes the whole device in general perhaps more adept to be used in modern times. And now we have pretty much gained an overview of what is available. If you do not want to install, by the way, Ghost Commander as a file manager, you can live also with the integrated open manager, which is a priori there in Android x86. And what is moreover to be found, and God knows why, uh, is, oops, uh, it's not here, it's in the old programs, is some weird Chinese app which comes with Android 86. It is this thing, yeah, I'm also very happy, but I have no idea what it is doing. <laughs> it seems to be, however, possibly some form of gambling app, and I don't know. <laughs> it is It is really, really funky and funny. It is so funny when you see such a nonsense app in a foreign language, because you realize they're all nonsense, and they all look like that. Just this time, it's even more evident. At least, perhaps, it's made more carefully than others I have seen, but I... I'm not into that, so that's not for me. All right. As to media players, I didn't mention anything because I didn't try anything out. I was not actually intending to much use this as a media consumption device. I mean, look at its screen. <laughs> Is this where I'm going to watch movies? I may listen to music, but here the requirements are low and I'm sure it can play MP3s. And that pretty much concludes the overview of what you can do with a classical Android installation on the EEPC 701 in modern days. So your biggest pain point in reality remains your browser. It is also pretty thin on the front of programming languages.
That perhaps allow me as a last remark because I just love it. <laughs> I did find, however, a basic interpreter. And you know, a computer without a basic interpreter, why would you even use that? Yeah, but this one has it. And if I print hi there, it does it. <laughs> so yeah, you can have X11 basic. And I got that one, I believe, straight from F-Droid. I got the IPK from there. So at least that would work. And while that may not be the most recently popular language, it is still something on which you can explore the general working of algorithms. So definitely that makes the device valuable for me. Yeah, we have arrived at the end of this, if you want, more normal stage. The next things we will be trying is to transgress the limitations of what is normal and usual and explore more alternative ways of using the netbook on Android. Ways which normally one would not stray into or at least you, you will stray into them mostly if you're an enthusiast. But if you are an enthusiast, likely you won't have an ancient in Android on your netbook to begin with. So maybe it is interesting to try that all out anyway. And without further ado, let us proceed to Alpine Linux. See, you may have noticed this little penguin staring at you. Let's make it a little larger so you can see it better. Yeah, now you see absolutely nothing, right? Great. <laughs> let's let's make it not so large again. <laughs> okay, so here you see my cursor being uh, by the app Linux Deploy. Now that used to be in the days before Termux, one very popular way of getting Linux on your phone. And that app, used to take care of all the associated bureaucracy of installing and running a Linux distribution onto your phone. And it offered you the possibilities of picking a CH root or a P root container. It allowed you to install different distributions. Like for instance, if I go here, on this down arrow and point to what I want to have. I can pick as a distribution Alpine or something else. I can even just import a root file system that I have compiled myself and just put there to be fetched and, and simply perused by this script. However, in practice, once you try that, you will notice how finicky that app truly is and more so even on Android x86 on the ASUS EEPC 701. And that is not just my impression. The forums are full with issues. So I picked Alpine, right? Do you think that was my first choice? Or oh, perhaps not. Perhaps I clicked on Debian, right? Yeah, and I went nowhere. Because the whole thing then somehow breaks down in the middle of the process, tells you some cryptic error message, and then you can go on a hunt to figure out what is wrong with it. And I had only so much nerve, because in essence, I wanted just a couple of simple things. In particular, I wanted to have a Lisp system. Interpreter or compiler, I didn't care all that much but I insisted on having a Lisp on my netbook. And my usual candidates weren't either to be found or were not working on x86 Android. Again, getting in my way that I am having the wrong architecture even though programs are available. So I went with Alpine. And it tells you that it will create an SSH server. It also gives you something about privileged users and whatnot. But the truth is nothing of this worked. It did install it, as opposed to my other experiments with Debian and uh, Ubuntu and whatnot, which simply failed. It was the version 241 of the app, in case you, by the way, care to get it. Version 251 did not work, but version 241 did. 
So if I say status here, will it do something? Oh, it just tells me some general information. All right. After you install things, in order to get into your system at all, you should go into the settings and there you will find stuff like update env, like update the environment. Yes, do that. Also, it is offering you to uh, enable a terminal which, as you can guess, it doesn't actually do. It doesn't enable a thing. So don't enable the terminal. Let me see where it was. You, you will anyway get your own terminal. You don't actually need to do that. Yeah, enable CLI. Don't. All right. So in version 241, you don't do any of these things. And after you install it, you simply exit. And then, yeah, then you simply go into a terminal, anything of your choice. For instance, I can pick here Termius. And then you go to a local connection. Hmm, terminals. No, I don't want it to be SSH. I want a local terminal. Yes. Right, so I have a nice local terminal here. You become root with su, and if it asks for permissions, you definitely give them. I have granted them already, this is why it didn't ask me. And then I created a script under system bin. And I called it Alpine for Alpine Linux, and I made it executable, of course. So this is to be executed as a root to go into the file place of Linux deploy, like into its directory, and then give it a, a command called Linux deploy there, demand a shell for the user root. That seems to be your only really working user over there. And also the one with which you might, yeah, log in over SSH and things like that. <laughs> I know, I know, some of you will be having a little bit of um, of skepticism about using root here everywhere, but I, well, went that way. I like to live dangerously, right? So if I say now Alpine, and in I am at home in a root, all right? And now I am in the Alpine environment and here with APK search, you can look for programs like I can search for browsers, for instance, hmm, that would be certainly something interesting to have. And then after you find a couple of browsers, you can APK install them. Hmm. I will, for instance, install here W3M. I haven't done so yet, but I would be interested in having it. Oops, it's not apk install, sorry, it's apk add. It has subtle differences from apt, though it is extremely similar to how apt is working. Yeah, that's it. And as to the browsers, let's have a look at them again. There were a couple of candidates which I found interesting. Okay, they're not even shown here, but one of them is called Aura Browser. You do also have here Dillo, you have um, Firefox, and you have Midori. But they don't actually work in an operable way. And you have cute browser, yeah. But the problem is that all of those are extremely slow. Like when you when you start when you start them, it takes an eternity to do anything at all with them. So my practical solution for browsing using Alpine Linux in reality is links. Yeah, if I go to google.at, just looks that way. And it's a text only browser, which is however of extremely decent quality. And it even does its best to match the fonts in the most readable way. And therefore, this is my recommendation for modern browsing on Android 404.
install Alpine Linux and get links. You'll quickly notice it's not counterintuitive at all. It's really nice actually. When you press escape you get here a nice um, menu and then you can have normal commands. So there isn't anything with uh, who knows how complex key combinations to remember or anything the like. It's just extremely intuitive and nice. And of course I did find embedded common lisp. Uh, I did not get to have SBCL, which would be my more usual distribution, but ECL I am very fond of just as well. So, yeah. Print. Woohoo! <laughs> and quit. So we do have a lisp, yeah? I mean, maybe we should just say cons one and two so yeah it, it does what lisp does right so this is actually a compiler and i yeah quit not exit depends on your lisp system is it exit or quit or whatever is it i can also use Control d and of course i have a midnight commander here right so well <laughs> Clearly, clearly it is a nicely, nicely set up environment which allows you to install a lot of things, including, by the way, the uh, GCC compiler suite and also Python, which provides me with a particular possibility. Let me see, is it here? Uh, CD PC basic. Did I keep it actually? Yes, I did. All right, and when I then say Python, yeah, Python 3 I need to say. Python 3 run minus basic, run minus PC ba basic dot PY. I did not yet figure out how to use the PIP system here, but well, some, some a little manual approach also does work. So what I got here is the famous PC basic basic interpreter, which is giving you a feeling of using GW basic from the 1980s. So you can say, I don't know, print, hello, 80s kids. <laughs> and you leave that one with system. So this is nice, you know, I love it. And now, you can play here around in any way you, you deem fit. And this indeed I leave into your hands. What we shall perhaps next explore is to make a graphical connection to our little Linux installation. For the purpose of graphical exploration, let me switch to Juice SSH. <laughs> we are here exploring different terminals, right? Yeah, so again, I say su. So. Yeah, now I allow it. I become thereby root. I execute Alpine. Grant myself a shell here. And now I am ready to start the graphical environment. And which graphical environment? Well, I decided to use VNC. And I installed a system called Tiger VNC. And moreover, all sorts of packages relating to fonts for when I started it up the first time, instead of rendering characters, just little boxes were being rendered. And I read that this is a known bug where the X server somehow is not able to render the default font Helvetica and is instead of that giving you little boxes. So this is why I was getting them in some places where Helvetica should be, but not in others. I did install also the MSTT core fonts. Yeah, if I search for them, if I search fonts, then here you see them, yeah? This is what you need to get, this is also what you need to execute, so this is going to give you decent fonts. And when you install Tiger VNC, search VNC, there you will see it again. Yeah, this one. <laughs> this, this is how it's written, okay? You have Lang and Doc, but you, you get the idea what the name is. When you install that one, you get a command called xvnc. And 
pardon the little interruption. So the VNC server is given to you after you install the Tiger VNC package, but before you can use it, you have to use the command VNC passwd in order to create a password file, which will then be used by the VNC server in order to protect the connection, basically. So we're saying then xvnc on display zero with a password file of our choosing, which we have like so named as we wish, giving it a geometry and finally an ampersand so you can start commands afterwards as well. And that's what happens. And to this, we could already connect on port 5900. However, uh, wouldn't it be nice to not just connect to an empty X display? If you're old enough, you know what that looks like. It's terribly ugly. But if we could also run there, for instance, the JWM window manager, a very minuscule one. I believe the parameter was display colon zero, right? So now we also have a window manager there and that perhaps should make it more useful for us to connect to. And now we are done actually in Alpine and now it's time to return to our main installation and launch our VNC viewer. I'm using this app. Be warned though that the versions 2 something did not work for me. I picked a version of 1.2 or something like that, a really old one for a really, really old version of Android, but in the 2 point something series but working on 86 processors. And that one is actually operational. So I go to local. And yeah, I think maybe I'm already there. Yes. Right. <laughs> So anyway, here I am, Oops, wrong, wrong mouse cursor, let's try again. The GWM window manager is already started up and now I can go here and I can go to the terminal and I can start up applications, right? This is uh, a little bit moving around here. It has a 640 times, uh, no, uh, 800 times 480 geometry but some of it is outside of my screen because unfortunately down here i have an additional black stripe which is covering some of the screen so i have to scroll a bit around but in general that's not a big deal and i can use it that way nicely and i can for instance launch here abby word i installed of course here office suits as well so that I can have real desktop office suits on a real desktop Linux. And that works exactly as you would assume. So, hey there, from inside Abbey Word, right? I also have Gnumeric and a couple of other graphical apps. I can close that now. Oopsie. Ah, yeah, wrong cursor. <laughs> see, the cursors are not exactly overlapping here. I have two. Yeah, you, you can see them perhaps more clearly now as I am on the document itself. So with this other cursor, I really need to go to the closing button. And now when I click, it will close it. Close without saving. Yes, close without saving. So you drag your virtual cursor a little bit around. It is not exactly comfy, but it is usable. Nonetheless, two things did not entirely work, and these were Midori and Firefox. So once I start Midori, I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and finally it's there, and let's try to go to Wiener Zeitung, exactly. Did, did I click, with, with which one did I click? Here I click. 
Yes, so now let's go to a certain Viennese newspaper in which you can find some statutory information regarding the company Registri in Austria. Uh, <laughs> but apart from that, also some news, of course. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and uh, I can tell you I did not experience it as overly useful. So this was just simply too slow to be practicable, right? I mean, I can also try to go somewhere else, but it should have loaded the page, though it doesn't exactly work. And I can try also Firefox, and there the situation is even worse. In brief, although I am able to have a graphical Linux environment, and although I am able to start browsers, this is mostly a sad and quite unbearable story. And you see, like, we're sitting here, we're waiting for Firefox to appear. Firefox is not sure when will it finally start up. Eventually it might even do that, but... We're here far from it being a pleasure to be used. You, you can wait here even a lot longer. All right, I'm just going to cancel it and I'm going to show you why it takes forever. I'm going to cancel it if I can cancel it. <laughs> Control C. Yeah, it finally did appear. Yes. But it's not something where, yeah, session restore. Yeah, very funny. I don't want my session to be restored. I just simply don't want to put up with this. Firefox is not to, not really usable. Let, let me tell you that far, and I believe you see this to be the case indeed already. So, we'll close it in a more civilized way, but we'll close it nonetheless. Very good. So... You might ask yourself, why is this so absolutely terrible? But you actually already guess why. Well, because, let me just press control C and it somehow doesn't quit it. Now this is terrible. I'm just gonna close the terminal. No, I don't want any help. Please don't. Please just leave me in peace. Yeah, we are back to our command prompt. The reason why everything is so low is the absolutely very small amount of free memory. From our 500 megabyte RAM, truly free, only some 32 megabyte. And this is why neither Midori nor Firefox nor anything bigger works in any satisfactorily in any satisfactory fashion Dillo however does so <laughs> that's not a very spectacular browser but it might be enough to to get any graphical impression of the internet though you can also get that with Lynx G Lynx has a graphical option right so apparently I can't even type here Maybe I can just simply, yeah, clear it. And then I go to bbc.com. And here I am on the BBC website. But it looks in such a way that I'm not sure what is the win of using this browser, right, rather than a text browser. It looks really just like the text browser with a couple more images but perhaps not worth the hassle. So if I just simply go back here again and go to the file menu and exit this thing, hopefully in a civilized fashion, we can also try the graphical links browser. Links minus G. Ah, not enabled when compiling. Okay, so I don't have a graphical browser right now. And that is a bit of an issue if you try to surf the internet 
with this system. You are essentially stuck with text-only links or the Lynx browser, which is like its cousin. You, you certainly have heard of it as well. Lynx, www, or, or simply bbc.com, for instance. And then it's going to ask you a million times about the cookies. No, it doesn't. Okay, so it has advanced a bit. And that is your alternative of surfing the net. So, indeed, you can, <laughs> but it's not as comfortable as when you simply install you know, Debian or something and just enjoy a moderately modern system and not having to go through antiquity. So that's about my ideas on browsing through Alpine directly, right? And now we shall explore <laughs> a truly a truly strange alternative. And as this video became quite long already and we have a long path ahead of us still, we shall make a little break here. And I thank you very much for joining in and for watching. Together we have explored how one can set up one's Android 404x86 on the ASUS EEPC701 and how one can use Linux Deploy and Alpine Linux in order to add further command line apps as well as graphical applications that can be used in a more desktop-like fashion. So what we have done so far is geeky but normal. <laughs> But ahead of us lies the unexplored territory in which we will try to navigate around certain limitations of Android, in particular with regard to virtual memory, and we shall look at the possibility to use the EEPC as a giant dump phone. Surprises lie ahead, so be sure to join in next time. I would be very glad if you do. And until then, I wish you a wonderful time. And from me, goodbye.